Their ships so massive, they would put an aircraft carrier to shame. So entirely, so totally gargantuan that not a single civilian port in the United States can accommodate them. A 68 ship fleet with a carrying capacity of up to 400,000 tons each. The Valamax class of ships is so powerful that it would take them just two journeys to transport the entire Great Wall of China, but for nearly their entire history, the Valamax ships have been highly controversial, from being outright banned in China to being lampooned by much of the sea shipping industry to a series of accidents that have tarnished the Valamax name. In today's episode of Mega Projects, we're going to be digging into the massive vessels and their groundbreaking complex history, all trying to answer one very important question. Was building the Valamax class even actually worth it at all? So in early August of 2008, the Chinese company Jiangsu Rongsheng Heavy Industries, or RSH Ivories, received a pretty massive order for construction. It was placed by a Brazilian mining company called Vali. They were requesting a series of 12 ships of a classification known as Very Large Ore Carriers. So named, if you're curious, because they're very large and they carry ore. Bali was willing to throw down $1.6 billion on the 12 ships, about $135 million per vessel, with an expectation that each vessel would have a deadweight tonnage of 400,000 tons. In regard to just how much carrying capacity Bali wanted, it was the biggest shipbuilding contract ever signed. Now, a ship of this size would have immediately shattered the record for the world's largest ore carrier as soon as it came onto the scene, but Varley's reasons for requesting them went a whole lot further than just chasing clout. You see, as a major export company for iron ore, the Brazilian corporation was contending with exporters like Australia, South Africa, and India who could offer the same product to the East Asian market much more cheaply. The problem, you see, was the Pacific Ocean, where a ship carrying the same amount of product would have far higher fuel and crew costs if it had to traverse the 20,000 kilometer journey. Brazilian iron ore is typically higher quality than those produced elsewhere, yet at a certain point those improvements just aren't worth the shipping costs. But by consolidating more ore into fewer ships, thus requiring fewer journeys across the sea, Vale could become much more competitive in China, South Korea, and elsewhere. In order to build a ship of that size, Varley had more than a few design constraints to consider. On the one hand, they wouldn't have to worry about any of the engineering requirements that would allow their ships to pass through the Panama Canal or other similarly narrow passages. The Valamax class was so damn big that no amount of over-engineering could have made that possible. But what the ships did need was a reinforced hull that would allow it to carry an enormous amount of ore. To give you an idea of what they were contending with here, imagine how hard it is to stop a moving freight train in a case of an emergency but then multiply the weight of that freight train by about a hundred, take away its brakes, and force it to operate with just a propeller and a rudder. With that sort of inertia at play, there are no light bumps into the side of a dock. At absolute best, there is a catastrophic collision that will cost millions upon millions of dollars. The solution was to split the hull into a series of seven cargo holds, each of which could be strengthened in order to make the hull itself difficult to compromise. And when these holds were engineered, it was also with an eye to the truly insane amounts of time it would take to load and unload a ship of Valamax size. Just to put it in perspective, a single crane would have to operate for just over 160 hours in order to unload a ship if it were at capacity. So that's about a week's work. Just before we dive back into today's video, I've got something exciting to share with you, and that's that this video is brought to you by Darkflow Software, the creators of the World War II shooter Enlisted. Enlisted is an FPS game like no other, where PvP beats PvE in epic battles. You'll lead a squad of customizable AI soldiers and join massive battles with hundreds of players. And guess what? Enlisted offers multiple campaigns, with each with unique weapons, vehicles, and gear, taking you from the outskirts of Moscow in 1941 to the heart of Berlin in 1940. Personally, I've enjoyed the campaigns. They feel like individual games, each offering an entirely new experience. Plus, you'll find over 100 weapons, tanks, and aircraft to unlock from classics like the M4 Sherman to obscure gems like the VG2. And speaking of customization, Enlisted lets you tailor your soldiers with unique skills and gear, creating your dream squad. And there's even more. Plus, the graphics and attention to detail are jaw-dropping 
even when you're playing on a lower end machine. And what's the best part? Enlisted is approachable for all players thanks to its realistic movement and target rich environment, yet it gets hardcore where it counts with intense battles and realistic damage models. So you can play Enlisted for free right now on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. Just head to playen.link forward slash megaprojects 2023, or because that's a bit of a mouthful, there is a link in the description below. And if you register using that link, you'll score a free bonus pack loaded with multiple weapons, soldiers, and a premium account. And now, back to today's video. In order to at least make the problem a bit easier, the Valamax cargo holds were designed in a way that eliminated nooks and crannies that would take time to get out, and they were balanced precisely in order to make sure that the ship wouldn't capsize if one side was loaded a little bit faster than the other. And it's important to note that while these sound like really small considerations, they are the absolutely critical factors that must be accounted for in order to prevent a hundred million dollar plus catastrophe. By all accounts, it would seem that Vali was confident in the ship's potential and their value as an investment. Within a year of their contract, they issued another for seven vessels to be built by South Korea. A year later, they requested 12 more of them. Vali's official goal was to build a full hundred of the ships, which according to the company would be just enough to handle the ore exports Vali felt that they could offer. 200 million tons of iron ore per year, requiring each ship to perform four year-round trips in a near-continuous shuttle to the Far East. This would allow them to defray a cost of just $17 to $18 per ton, vastly more appealing than uh, what Brazil to East Asia transport costs had been before they arrived. By 2011, the first Valamax ship, appropriately dubbed the Vale Brazil, was delivered from South Korea. A few months later, the Vale China was launched from China's Nantong shipyard, and two other ships would be delivered before the end of the year. Seven more would hit the open water by the end of 2012, and before long, that steady flow turned into a cascade. Despite early construction delays on the Chinese side, the entire first series of ships would be finished by 2016, and in the same year, three Chinese companies and one from Japan would place their own orders for a total of 33 more of the vessels. In next to no time, the Valamax had gone from just taking off to mounting a full takeover of the shipping industry. When we dig into the specifications for the Valamax class, one thing should be clear above all else. These things are f***ing big. A typical Valamax ship is built at 360 meters long, or about 1,181 feet. That's longer than a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, about the same length as the biggest cruise ship in the world, and almost four times the length of Big Ben in London if it were laid on its side. Its beam, that is to say its width, is 65 meters, 213 feet, and when it's fully loaded, it has a draft of 23 meters, or 75 feet. That means, at full carrying capacity, the bottom of the ship's hull is 70 25 feet under the surface of the water, just barely shallow enough to pass through the Suez Canal without literally scraping the bottom. This also makes them unable to dock at the vast majority of the world's ports. The only reason they weren't built even bigger is so that they could fit into the biggest ports in China. The ships are powered by a single diesel engine rated at about 39,000 horsepower. By the way, that's more horsepower than there are horses in the entire Czech Republic. A lot of horses. The ship's propeller is 10 meters tall, that's 33 feet, and gives the Valamax a service speed of about 28 kilometers per hour, that's 17 miles per hour. In exchange, it consumes about 100 100 tons of heavy fuel every single day, but for what it's worth, that's actually a fairly impressive efficiency rate compared to most long distance bulk carriers. You see, because of how large the ships are, they've brought down Vale's emissions rate by 35% in comparison to older ships that they've been operating. Later model Valamax ships have more powerful engines, but ones that are built with emissions in mind, cutting them down by another 20%. A typical ship requires a crew of 22 personnel to operate, but they've often got space for as many as 35 people on board. And then there's the size of the ship's interior, which deserves its own consideration. Each of their cargo holds can hold nearly as much ore as an entire Panamax carrier. That is a ship that is of the maximum size that can fit through the Panama Canal. And at seven cargo holds per Valamax, the ships are game-changing for companies who now don't need to bother with the canal in order to do business. 
On its inaugural voyage, the first Valamax class ship, Valo Brazil, completed its journey from São Luis to Taranto, Italy. Even as early as this first voyage, though, there was already speculation that Brazil's new ships were making waves elsewhere. The ship had been intended to arrive at Dalian in China, but had been forced to turn back after rounding the tip of South Africa. At the time, rumors abounded that Vali had been barred from bringing the ship to China, perhaps because Chinese officials had hoped that the first Valamax ship to arrive there would have been the one that China built. But regardless, Vali insisted that the ship was rerouted for commercial reasons, and before long, the incident became just a mere footnote. Soon afterwards, Vali's ships had visited most of the major global global shipping destinations that could handle a vessel of their size, from Japan to Oman to the Philippines to the Netherlands. The Valimax era was truly underway. All right, so now we're going to ask everyone watching this to join us in a bit of a thought experiment. Take off your Mega Projects Appreciator hat and put on your Iron Ore Exporter Tycoon hat, specifically from the perspective of one of the many Australian, Chinese, South African, Indian, or other companies that have been very happily running their businesses before the Valamax class came along. From their perspective, the Valamax ships could be as impressive as they wanted. In reality, that didn't really matter though. What mattered was that the Valamax was a threat to their bottom line, bringing in higher quality ore at competitive prices and basically undercutting the rest of the entire market. So when the Valamax class was announced to the world, it was immediately met with frustration and criticism across the heavy shipping industry. If they were to enter service, the ships were all but guaranteed to drive down freight rates for everyone in an industry that was already struggling to fill its existing ships with enough cargo to turn a profit. When the ships first set sail, it was in a world that was still recovering from the 2008 financial crisis, and between the drop in freight costs and the amount of ore the Valamax ships uh, would take off the market, they risked putting hundreds of smaller ships permanently out of work. Now, of course, from Varley's perspective, none of this sounded like an issue, but the rest of the shipping world they saw things differently. And the company raised serious concerns in China as well. By this time, Vali had shown their willingness to try and control the price of ore in the country, and with their new ships, it seemed as if they wanted to exert the same sort of control around the freight market itself. When fully loaded, the Valamax ships also violated Chinese safety and environmental laws, but Vali's executives remained insistent that their ships would go to China regardless, a demand that China struggled to say no to because of how critical Vali's supply of ore was at that time. China's response to the Valamax in 2012 was to ban them from all Chinese ports, even despite the fact that many of the ships still had yet to be delivered from China to Bali. Although those ship deliveries went uninterrupted, the entire class of ship was pushed out of China, basically freezing billions of dollars that Vale had dedicated to their operation. In response, Vale completely refused to work with ships provided by Costco, China's largest shipping conglomerate. In the intervening years, Vale relied on a center that they'd built in the Philippines in anticipation of such a problem, allowing allowing them to unload their Valamax ships close to China and do the rest of the journey with smaller vessels. It wasn't until 2015, when an oversupply of iron ore drove prices unsustainably low, that both sides were able to work past their differences. Since then, though, China's had a clear change of heart, with several more ports being expanded to fit Valamax class ships when they couldn't have been fit there before. The Valamax class has prompted a massive shift in China's shipping industry, with those prior rules limiting ships of that size basically just being thrown out the window. But even before the Valamax class ships were banned in China, they also received another black eye. And that was a structural failure in one of their ships, the Vale Beijing. In 2011, this ship was in the process of being loaded with 300,000 metric tons of ore for what should have been its first revenue-generating trip across the ocean. But during the loading process, cracks began to develop in the ship's hull, spreading to the ballast tanks and causing them to rupture. This is the kind of known issue that's among shipping companies' worst fears. In truly catastrophic scenarios, older ore transports have been known to snap apart while being unloaded in port and sink along with their cargo because of how much stress the heavy iron ore puts on the hull. Fearing the worst, the ship was drained of its fuel and towed out into open water. With about 250,000 tons of ore already on board, that way, if it did sink, at least it wouldn't put port personnel at risk. The ship was unloaded in a hurry with its cargo transferred to any other bulk carrier that could get to it, and luckily it was able to avoid a complete rupture of the hull. Moreover, it was able to be cleared without completely halting operations at its home port, which at that time oversaw 10% of all the iron ore production of the entire world. Later inspections would find that the ship was still structurally sound, even during the accident, meaning that it was highly unlikely that it would have broken apart. Nonetheless, it was cited as a major reason for China not allowing the Valamax ships in port. Whether this was the entire truth of the matter, or if China had already been planning to prohibit them, we obviously 
can't say. But the desire not to have such a massive ship split in half while in port is honestly pretty understandable. In 2013, another ship, the Vale Indonesia, would run aground, and in 2020, the NSU Carias, also a Valamax ship, smashed into two other bulk carriers while at a port in Brazil. Luckily, no personnel have ever been harmed in an accident involving a Valamax class vessel, but the ship's list of mishaps in a few short years of operation is perhaps not an encouraging sign. In fact, so beleaguered was the Valamax class that at certain points the Vale company even discussed the idea of just selling them off. But with Beijing Jing's ban on the ships finally lifted, the Valamax class has been able to reach its full potential. In 2016, Vale did sell three of its ships to the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, but this time the conversations around a sale were done on Vale's terms. You see, now it was a ship that was finally proving its worth to the world. In the years since, conversations around the Valamax have moved to topics like how to make them more fuel efficient, how to integrate cloud data infrastructure onto the vessels, and how more and more ports are being upgraded in order to receive them. By all accounts, the Vale company's perseverance with the ship has paid off. As we write this in 2023, the Valamax class still sails the high seas, and now they operate basically unimpeded by trade regulations, safety bans, or international controversies. Despite their disruptive effect on the iron ore trade, the market has flexed to accommodate them. And despite their size and insane levels of fuel consumption, they are a more fuel-efficient option to transport their cargo than a bigger fleet of smaller ships would ever have been. The structural failure of the Vale Beijing has proven to be an isolated incident, and they've avoided the sort of ever-given star buffoonery that might have lowered their stock today. Do they come with caveats? Yeah, absolutely. But all things considered, the biggest bulk carrier ever built has turned out to be, well, pretty good after all. Don't click away just yet, just a quick reminder that if you go to playen.link forward slash megaprojects2023 or check the description below, you can start playing Enlisted today and you'll snag that free bonus pack. So what are you waiting for? Dive into the action with Enlisted today and thank you for watching.